Good morning. My name is Donald. I'm one of the pastors here at First Alliance Church, and uh, what a, an awesome privilege it is to worship with you today. And may I repeat what has been said earlier. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers and grandfathers, and uh, as Mariah said, fathers to be. Uh, it is so good. It is so good that we have a heavenly Father who loves us. And I often say he loves us not because he likes what we are, but he loves us in spite of. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. He doesn't love us because he likes what we are, because of the things that we do. He loves us just because of who he is. And I tell you what, I will have it no other way. Praise God. Praise God. We are continuing our study today from the book of Nehemiah, and uh, may I say how wonderful it is to see the young people stand up and read the Word of God. Uh, that means that they are reading the Word of God at home, and so what a wonderful and awesome thing that is. Today we're going to be talking from Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, Wisdom Against the Enemy's Scheme. And I think about who we are, and uh, the thought comes to my mind, unique among the religions of the world stands Christianity, wherein the number one qualification for being a member is that the applicant must be totally unworthy of it. Unique among the religions of the world stands Christianity where the number one qualification for being a part is that the applicant must be totally unworthy of it. It speaks of our amazing grace that we've received from our Father. How glad I am. And as we talk today, we're going to see how the Lord works not just in the New Testament, but God has been at work all along. Someone was saying that, you know, we need to hear God speaking. Well, God is always speaking. He is all, God has been speaking ever since before creation. As a matter of fact, the world exists because God spoke. He spoke and said, let it be, and it was so. And God continues to speak. And now our task is to listen to what God is saying. Be discerning. Today we'll spend a little time talking about Nehemiah and his dealings with those who were in opposition to his mission to rebuild the wall of the broken and the burned wall of Jerusalem. And because today is Father's Day, we will weave a bit of uh, text in here, a little word about fathers and uh, I believe it will come out appropriate. And so, as I'm accustomed to saying, I invite you, as a matter of fact, I plead with you to pray for me as I speak. That is to your benefit. Because the more you pray for me, the more the Lord will speak through me to you. And how important, you don't want, to, you don't want Donald Smith. You don't need Donald Smith, you need Jesus. You need the word of God to speak to your hearts. And so I unashamedly ask you to pray for me as I speak. I ask the Lord to speak to me and through me. And from the passage that was read, uh, now when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem, the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, then Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Kephirim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. Wisdom against the enemy's scheme. Wisdom is from God. 
Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. In this context, the word wisdom speaks of both dread of punishment from God as well as piety toward God. It is not just living to avoid God's wrath, but also, more importantly, walking in obedience to him because we love him. Walking in loving obedience to him. James says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. Proverbs 2, 6 through 11 says, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice. And he preserves the way of the godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. From wisdom, or for wisdom will enter your heart. And knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you and guard you. Understanding will watch over you. Wisdom is needed as we go through this life. We need wisdom because wisdom will guide us in dealing with our enemies. How necessary it is when you come against uh, individuals who seek to harm you or seek to stop the work that God has called you to do. You need wisdom in order to deal with that. Wisdom keeps us focused on the task. Wisdom keeps us focused on the task. All work is not equal. Works may be good within and of themselves. However, the question must always be asked, how should this work be ranked in priority? Nehemiah did not entertain the request from the enemy. He didn't suggest that they had, had evil intentions, although he knew that they had evil intentions against him. It is not necessary to share your knowledge of the enemy's scheme. You don't have to argue with this enemy. It is only necessary that you remain focused on the Lord and what the Lord has called you to do. Yeah. Uh, let me say that again. We don't have to get down arguing with the enemy. We just need to stay the course of where the Lord has us walking. And he will guide our path. And whatever the Lord calls you to do always fits into the category of great work. You may think it is insignificant, but if you're called to be a Sunday school teacher, that is a great work. Why? Because God called you to do that. Yes. Whatever it is, if you're called to sweep the floors, that is a great work. Why? Because God has called you to do it. Think about the Great Commission. Why is it called the Great Commission? First of all, it is great because it comes from the greatest. Jesus declared after his resurrection, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Let me say that again. All power in heaven and earth has been given into my hands. And then he says, go therefore and make disciples. It is great because of its scope. He says, go and make disciples of all people, of all nations. It's great because it is the only hope for mankind. Lost people matter to God. He wants them found. I heard that. I've seen that written somewhere. Oh, that's a part of the Alliance Co. value. But you knew that, didn't you? Of course you did. Lost people matter to God. He wants them found. And if they matter to God, they ought to matter to you and to me who have been called by God. <laughs> Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son came to seek and to save them that are lost. That's the reason Christ came into the world. Like the wall of Jerusalem, the human race was in ruin. The beginning words uh, to the hymns, uh, Man of Sorrow says this, Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Jesus came to rebuild, to restore that which had been lost. Nehemiah was on mission from God, and that made his work a great work. It was God who placed the condition 
uh, of the city of Jerusalem or the walls of Jerusalem in the condition in which they were. It was God who placed that on Nehemiah's heart in the beginning. It was God who gave him favor with the king, wherein he asked all kinds of favors that he might, first of all, be able to go, but then he asked for, for transport. He asked for materials in order to restore the wall. It was God who gave him favor with the king. And you recall in the first chapter, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. He prayed for four months before he even made mention of any of this to the king. So God prepared not only Nehemiah's heart, God prepared the king's heart to respond. It was God who gave Nehemiah the plans for the rebuilding of the wall. It was God who enabled him to convince the people to do the work. We are doing the work of making disciples and completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every fully devoted disciple. Oh, I read that somewhere else too. But then you knew that. That's another one of the Alliance core values. Completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every fully devoted disciple. And Nehemiah did not lay every stone. He did not hammer every nail by his own hands. He got people to work with him. And doing the work of the Great Commission takes people. Amen. And that's you and me. You know, I only heard one amen to that. It's okay if you know it's right. It's okay to say amen. It, it, it really is. Take, take my word for it. It's okay to say amen. Uh, thank you. It was God who enabled the completion of the wall in 52 days. The enemies were amazed that it was done in such a short period of time. It was God who gave Nehemiah wisdom to know the schemes of the enemy. It is God to whom all glory belongs. Everything comes from God, and all glory belongs to God. May I stop here and, and, and kind of shift gears and say a word to the fathers. You may not be called to build a wall of protection around a city, but there are walls of protection which you are called to build. What are some of these walls of protections? First of all, the first wall is the wall concerning your own mind. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the issues of life. And so we must, first of all, guard our minds because the enemy is always seeking to put in our minds that which is displeasing to God. He is the enemy of God. And by the way, that makes him your enemy as well. Romans 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, so the first wall we need to be concerned about is the wall of our mind, the mind, wall of our hearts, to make sure that we are guarding against anything that will come in against our God. The second wall is the wall of our marriage. I found a plaque many years ago that says the greatest thing that my father can do for me is to love my mother. The greatest, and I, I bought that and I took it home and I set it up. This, somebody, I just saw it and I had to have it. It had to be two, three, maybe three, I don't know, at least three decades ago that I found that. The best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. You see, the children need to... Thank you, dear. <laughs> the children need to understand. The children need to know what it means when they get married. They need to know what true love is like. They need to see it modeled in the home. And the father takes the lead in that. Amen. Wow, this is hard. Man. <laughs> Y'all want some water or something? Uh, <laughs> man, oh man. 
The children need examples. They not only need the teaching words, the wisdom from the father's lips, they need to see it lived out in their lives. And so you fathers, we need to be about the business of building the walls around our marriage for protection. May I suggest to you that you're not raising children so that one day they will become disciples of Jesus. Nope. You're raising from the moment they're born disciples of Jesus so that they will take on the world as they grow up. I think I need to say that again. You are not raising children so that they will one day become disciples of Jesus Christ. From the moment of their birth, you're raising disciples of Jesus Christ so that they will take on the world as they grow up and conquer the world for Jesus. And so we need to build that wall, men. We need to be careful and make sure that we do that. I came across something, and and you, many of you probably have heard it before, 12 rules for raising delinquent children. The origin of it says that the 12 rules for raising delinquent children, the list has been a part of the online world since 1998. But the earliest print sighting of this piece dates back to 1959 when it appeared in a newspaper. And it was after making a study of juvenile delinquency, the police department of Houston, Texas, issued a leaflet containing 12 rules on how to raise juvenile delinquents. They are, number one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. Number two, when he picks up bad habits, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. Number three, never give him spiritual training. Wait until he is 21 and then let him decide for himself. I remember hearing this on more than a few occasions. People talking about, well, I'm not going to burden my children with, with, with taking them to church or, or teaching them about Christ. Christ. Uh, I'm going to wait until they get an old enough to do it for themselves. You know what? I do not say anybody, I cannot say who does and who does not know Jesus. But anybody that says that I have a strong suspicion that they do not have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ themselves, because if they did, they would want everybody, not just their children, to know him. I'm going to wait until he grows up. They don't do that when it comes to his education. No, you have to go to school. You, you, will, you sit. No, no, I, I'll give you some aspirin. You go to school. <laughs> Got a stomach, here's some Pepto-Bismol. You go to school. But when it comes to the things of the Lord, I will wait until he grows up. It doesn't work that way. You begin, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin, you understand that you begin to raise disciples from the moment of their birth. Everything you do and everything you see is about teaching them to know and love Jesus. Number four, avoid the use of the word wrong. It may develop in the child a guilt complex. This will prepare prepare him to believe that when he's punished later for stealing cars or assaulting women, society is against him and that he is being persecuted. Number five, pick up everything after him, his shoes, his books, his clothes, do everything for him so that he will be experienced in throwing his responsibilities onto others. Number six, let him read anything he wants. Have no concern whatever for what goes into his mind. Be careful that the silver and drinking classes are sterilized, but let his mind feast on garbage. Number seven, quarrel frequently in the presence of your child, then he will not be shocked if the home is broken up later. Number eight, give a child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you had them? Number nine, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every sensual desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Number 10, take his part against policemen, teachers, and neighbors. 
They are all prejudiced against your child. Number 11, when he gets into real trouble, apologize for yourself by saying, I never could do anything with him. And number 12, prepare for a life of grief. You will be likely to have it. Fathers, let's remember, we have a responsibility to build that wall and to make it secure around our families. And to the church at large, we are called to build a wall around the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about that, and I won't get deep into that because uh, we're going to be doing a series on that later this summer, but uh, it's talking about building up the body of Christ. And he gave some apostles and evangelists and teachers, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. And we are called to be about the business of building up the body and not tearing it down. The enemy does not want to see any of these things happen. So he will do everything that he can to put a stop to it. And may I say that the enemy is persistent. He's persistent in his schemes. Verse 5 of Nehemiah chapter 6. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me in the same matter a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. A fifth time. I mean, he didn't give up. He didn't give up, but neither did Nehemiah. The enemy's schemes are persistence, distractions, fear, and discouragement. Five times, little by little, inch by inch, and church beware how the enemy comes in. He may come in in ways that you do not perceive. Because the enemy is not necessarily the person that you can see. Paul writes to the saints at Ephesus, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we must be ever aware, we must be vigilant, because little things come in, little things come in, and inch by inch, little by little, they begin to eat away at the fiber of what it means to be walking after the Lord. So we must be very careful. Little by little, letter by letter, he said five times he wrote to Nehemiah. But Nehemiah kept answering him the same way. The enemy is not always interested in winning an argument. Sometimes he simply wants to occupy your time in order to take your attention away from what you are supposed to be doing. Have you ever been in, in discussions with people who, who, who want to ask you questions about the Bible or about what it means to follow Jesus, about who Jesus is, about who God is, and every time you give an answer, they come back with another answer. And I remember some years ago, I was working at a company and uh, I needed some, some, some extra money. Um, and uh, I started receiving emails from an individual and, and, and I, you know, I'm thoroughly convinced that, that the emails were coming from my boss, but I could never say that to him. And the email started off, first of all, talking about something wonderful concerning the Lord, which actually it wasn't wonderful because what he was saying, it sounded wonderful, but it was actually a lie, so it couldn't be wonderful. But then he began to challenge me on question after question, and, and I would spend time digging and making sure that I responded well. I would you know, draft my, my email responses, and I spent a lot of time doing that. And time after time after time, I would answer his question, and he would just always come back with one other question. See, the enemy isn't always interested in receiving understanding. They're not interested in receiving the truth. They just want to keep you occupied. And when I had figured out that this is what that enemy was doing, that individual was doing, and, and I call that person enemy, an enemy of the Lord, but in the natural realm, a very nice man, very nice man. As a matter of fact, when I had left that place, he walked me to my car, and, and I reported him. He said, Mr. Donnell, um, he said, I want you to know that you've set the bar really high here. 
Uh, and if you ever need to come back here, you've got a friend. We would welcome you to come back and work in this place. But I'm thoroughly convinced, and he did, I did know that my, 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 my manager was an atheist. And I wonder from time to time, what did my responses do? What did the Lord do with those responses? But I did come to the realization that I had to stop because he did not want the truth, at least at that time. Sanballat was writing to Nehemiah. And what he wanted more than anything was to stop Sanballat from doing what Sanballat was there, what Nehemiah was there to do. And so he wasn't looking for answers to stop the work. And we need to be mindful of that as well. Be very, very careful about allowing yourself to be tied up time and time and time again. Be courteous, be kind, but know when to cut it off. Another scheme of the enemy is public opinion. He says here, oh my, I just looked at my clock, that's all. But, but you all have anywhere to go, do you? <laughs> and it was written, it is reported among the nations, that is the heathens, and Gashmu says that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, therefore you are building the wall, and you are to be their king according to these reports. You've also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah. And now we'll be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. It's reported among the, the nations, among the heathens. Public opinion. What the world thinks versus what God says. I remember some years ago in a certain location where I was pastoring and uh, I became acquainted with a pastor of another denomination. As a matter of fact, he had come to our church to participate in, a, in an event that we had and I thought since he'd been there a long time, I, would, I was concerned about the drug problem that was rising all over our nation and so I asked him if he would consider calling the pastors that he knew together that we might begin to pray concerning the drug problem that our country has, is seeing. Well, I didn't hear from him right away, but several months later, I got an email from him saying that there was going to be a meeting at a certain location. And the purpose of that meeting was to call in uh, the public to see what the public's has to say about the drug problem and what answers they may have in solving the issue of the drug problem. I'm saying, huh? I thought I asked you if you would consider calling the other pastors together that we may begin to pray to seek God. But instead, they'd gather a lot of people who I can't say whether they knew the Lord or not. But they had come, and they were giving the world's viewpoint as to how to deal with the drug problem instead of seeking God. The, the meeting was headed by pastors. But I must tell you that in all of that meeting, I did not hear the name of Jesus mentioned one time. I did not hear them pray one time about the matter. There's the word of God, and there's the world. And Sanballat is saying to Nehemiah, hear what the world is saying about what you're doing. Well, Sanballat, I mean, Nehemiah had his orders from God. And so he didn't need to be concerned about the world, what the world thought. We need to be ever so mindful the enemy seeks to frighten us, to make us afraid to the point of distraction so that we will no longer be involved in the work that the Lord has called us to do. And may I say, today the church in America 
is being distracted. We're being distracted by politics. Ladies and gentlemen, politics are not going to solve our problems. Popular opinion is not going to solve our problems. Popular opinion is always opposed to the word of God. And we need to stay centered on what God's word says. Ephesians 5, 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words because of these things. And, and before that, it, uh, in the earlier part of chapter 5, he, God is talking about, Paul is talking about things that we should not be doing. But he says, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let no one deceive you with empty words. He says that it's to the saints at Corinth. Let no one deceive you. Do not be deceived. And we need to be about the business of doing what God has called us to do. We need to make sure that we are not attempting to make church members instead of making disciples. And again, I need to say that again. We need to be certain that we are not about the business of making church members. We need to be about the business of making disciples of Jesus Christ. This is what he called us to do. Make disciples. We talk about the ch Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Let the words of Christ to the congregation of Ephesus in Revelation 2 be a sober reminder to us today of the importance of not being distracted from what Christ has called us to do. That is from Christ himself. Let us be reminded of how important it is Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. Let us be careful. Nehemiah had it together, and he could not be swayed. And we want to walk like Nehemiah as we build the walls that God has called us to build. We need to be diligent. We need to stay the course. And we need to look to God because wisdom from God guards our path. He says in verse 10 of Nehemiah 6, When I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Merherabel, who was confined at home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, Should a man like me flee, and could one such as I go into the temple to save his life, I will not go in. Well, he said, then I perceived that truly God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him to do so. Save yourself! What did the thief on the cross say to Jesus? If you be the son of God, save yourself in us. Save yourself! What did Peter say when Jesus said, I'm going to the Jerusalem and, and I'm going to be uh, be, 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 be uh, hurt and, and I'm going to be abused by the people and I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be raised the third, third day. And Peter says, Lord, far be it. Far be that. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For you're concerned about the things of man and not the things of God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about the staff here. It's not even about you. It is about Jesus. Now, everybody ought to say amen to that. Amen. It's about Jesus. And we need to stay the course. We need to make sure that we are head on so that we might be about the business of finishing the work that God has called us to do. And so it says, so the wall was completed in verse 15 on the 50, 25th of the month Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounded us saw it, they lost their confidence. and They recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Whatever we do, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so that we are to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever it is you're called to do, whatever wall you have been called to build, stay the course. Do not allow the enemy to distract you. 
Do not allow the enemy to discourage you. Do not allow the enemy to make you afraid. But stay the course and know that you are working for your Lord and your Savior. The praise team can come back up, please. This is important work that we are doing. The work is great. Even as the work of the rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem was great for Nehemiah, the work that we do is a great work because it is a work that has been called by God. And we're doing this work not as unto men, we're doing this work as unto God. That which we do is for the glory of God. For your good, but above your good, it is for the glory of God and we need to keep that in focus in everything that we do from sweeping floors to standing in the pulpit to teaching Sunday school to, to leading worship it is all for the glory of God 